after we had the creative part, I will take a little bit of a critical note um, for reasons that as a scientist, I am pretty good at it. As a personal um, um, cynical person, I am also pretty good at it. Uh, and my colleague will take the a little bit more progressive, um, opti optimistic part of this, uh, first, um, this first part. So I will start with reflecting a little bit on what I saw today and yesterday during this conference. And then I'll go into uh, a little bit into uh, the problems that I've been uh, facing at the university in my, um, in my career. And I'll maybe hint a little bit uh, about the possible solutions. So what, my, what, what, what uh, struck me, especially in, 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 in during both days, that in day one, um, a lot of uh, elderly scholars uh, who had um, very nice presentations, <laughs> Basically, um, but what struck me most is that they tried to convince me that um, the university is, um, so to speak, on fire, and that that goes especially for the for the for the um, faculty of, of of the humanities. Um, during the second day, people tried to convince me that uh, the changes, the world is changing a lot around us. But for me personally, both were not very convincing. Um, First, uh, to, to go back to day one, what we experience at the, un at, at the University in Utrecht is that um, we don't see a decline in the number of uh, student applications. It actually goes very well. We also do not get reports that there is a lot of um, the students uh, that, that uh, finish their studies that are without a job. In Holland, actually, lawyers um, and ICT technicians are the people that are without jobs right now. It's actually, in, in, in law, it's, it's, it's so bad that for this year they, um, they have a numerous fixes on law students because there are simply too much of them. So I, I actually do not see uh, this, this um, thing back in, 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 in the number of students that we have. Also, the quality of students is actually, as was pointed out also a couple of times, is actually pretty good. I started law school in uh, 1994, and I think that uh, the whole faculty would be very happy with an, 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 an attendance perce percentage of 60%, because it was f far, far less. And I don't think that, that um, things really changed in what is the attention, I mean, uh, how, ma how many students attend the lectures, what, what, what is the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the intention, motivation of the students, because in 1994 it was not that great either, actually. Um, the mistake that one makes often is that one uh, um, tries to see students as mirrors of uh, yourselves, but actually we were, the, I mean, most of us were the nerds, so we were highly motivated, but the people that were sitting next to us, or maybe a little bit more in the back of the uh, thing, were not that motivated at all also. Already 10, 20 years ago, they, they didn't really change. I don't really see that changing. Um, according to the day one also, um, I, I, I don't see that big an impact of the, of the technological um, uh, progress that has been made. Now you can call your mom that you're late for dinner, otherwise you just had to wait for half an hour. But I, I don't really see a, 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 a huge change in how people um, uh, approach uh, university and how people interact and, and stuff. So, uh, Which makes me al always question what is the motive um, of the people that do preach these things. Um, and I think that is always very important to, uh, to, um, to address. Um, that is not to say that uh, one should not be um, in, um, innovative and try to make use of, 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 um, of technologies and stuff uh, to make uh, teaching and to make uh, the, the knowledge transfer um, better. Um, but my uh, colleague will go into that a little bit more. Uh, more. So, for as, as to end up, the, some of the problems. I've, uh, basically, the main problem that I encountered uh, is during during my career so far as a, as a, as a scholar is that um, the younger generation is confronted with rules that are um, 
set up by the elderly people that do not affect themselves. If you are in a tenure position, you don't, do not really feel the, 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 uh, the, re, the uh, results of, of, uh, of this. If you are uh, uh, now a beginning um, scholar, you have to get your own money. That means that you cannot get a mortgage, you cannot buy a house and all that kind of uh, uh, things. And I think that's a, very, um, that's a very bad thing because the real nerds are not here. The real nerds work, work in companies. The, 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 the people that I, my, my colleague students that are really smart chose not to go to university. And that is the thing I think that has a change. Um, so what is the younger generation? We just end up uh, trying to play the game as good as we can. Uh, in, in my case, it's not that bad. I like publishing a lot, actually. I like writing grant applications. So for me, I, I, don't, really, um, I don't really mind. Um, but I think for the, for the future of, of university as, as, as the pinnacle of, of uh, uh, knowledge uh, and education, that is a, is a, is a, yeah, might, be a, might become a problem. Um, what we could do about it uh, is basically, I think, keep uh, your back straight. Um, as, 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 as far as I am forced to, to, to play the game, I also understand that deans and uh, so forth are also to some extent forced to play the game of the, what was called uh, neoliberalism, the, the new, this new kind of management in which every, uh, everything is, um, broken down to a simple set of numbers. Basically, the reason why these people need numbers is because they do not understand the content. Um, but, and for, for example, keeping your back straight, that can, start about, uh, that can start with the concept of valorization. I know that uh, in, for the rector of my un uh, university, this is a very important uh, point. I do not agree with, but um, the thing is, uh, grant applications and journal uh, things, tenure uh, uh, things are, are still peer reviewed by a committee that can decide by themselves how do they interpret this need for knowledge valorization. So uh, I would very much like to see uh, the, 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 the older generation to use this, this, uh, this, this room for interpretation to um, um, to at least steer in, 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 in a non-econometric um, direction. And I think this is, I'll keep it with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So now it's the youngest uh, uh, panel member here. Uh, Esther Krabbelen, she's still a student, student in history and Italian language and culture at the University of Amsterdam. This year he's president of ASFA, which is a student union representing all students in Amsterdam. As a student in humanities, she's founded a platform to preserve unique language studies in the Netherlands, and she's initiator of Alpha Pact, a way to bridge the gap between humanities, <coughs> business, and society. Esther, the floor is yours. Well, I also uh, relate uh, presentation or something. I am reading it from my iPad, so it's a bit... Uh, um, and going to this conference, I also was kind of skeptic, because looking up the list of speakers, I was, and I hope I don't insult anyone, uh, a bit disappointed in the average uh, age of the speakers. Because during a conference about the future of the university, wouldn't it be interesting, I wondered, to invite a lot of young, enough disc scholars to talk about their ideas about the future of the university and to also let them tell about the way they are going to bring this into action. And with my experience in meetings with a lot of scholars in humanities, I was also afraid that this would be another conference where a lot of uh, humanity experts, experts would rage against the world, not understanding them, the government not funding them, and students not wanting them. And because of this, I must admit that yesterday morning, I was positively surprised by the point of view from which most of the speakers addressed the problem. Yes, the humanities are in a crisis, but we can do something about it. Where the first lecturers gave an, in my opinion, terrific summary of the problems we are facing, less and less government funding, the rise of quantity-based rankings and technological innovations threatening to swipe away the university as we know it now and we are used to. Um, but after that, talks focus more and more around what's the future of knowledge 
and what's the future of humanities? I'm still blown away by this morning's talk about technology. And also on the question, what it is then, what, what we have to do? And that question isn't an easy one to answer. It's a question I've asked myself already a lot of times, and a question I've talked about with friends, other students and teachers. Because as a student in humanities, and as a re representative of students, next to being worried, I want to change the things I'm worried about. That's why last year, together with other students from ASFA Student Union, we started an initiative. We first looked to the other side, to the betas. Because in Holland, we differ between alpha, gamma, and beta sciences, where alpha being the humanities, uh, gamma the social sciences, and beta being natural sciences. Let's say um, everything you need math for. Uh, last year, our government, businesses, and universities launched the Beta Technique Pact, uh, which is a pact in which all parties made deals about how to get more young people involved in beta and technical studies. Universities and middle schools agreed to promote these studies, businesses assured internships, and the government brought in some money. And um, so this is the focus from the government shifting in the last couple of years to be more and more beta-minded. Uh, top sector beleid, uh, profilering, it's for the Dutch people that they probably know it. And for me and my colleagues, this was the moment we, we realized something had to change. And we thought what the betas can do, we can do better. They might have more lobbying power and they might have a bigger mouth, but that's something we can and we have to learn. So we launched the idea to start an Alpha Pact. An Alpha Pact has much more challenges than the Beta Technique Pact. The focus will not, as the Beta Technique Pact, be on convincing young people to start a study in humanities, although that would be a great side effect, but it will be to bridge the gap between humanities and on the one hand society and on the other hand business. And with this, we want to step aside from vague terms and emotional argu arguments about why the humanities are so important, but for once and for all, get scholars and students in humanities to explain themselves clearly why they are of great importance. We want to inspire humanities students, uh, hum <laughs> humanities students to excel not only in academic research, but also in social innovation. Next to that, we want to make concrete deals with business, with universities and with the government. We want more internships available for students in humanities. We want universities promoting educational minors and minors in young entrep entrepreneurship. We want to inspire teachers to think more innovative about the way to give education. We want examples, important people from society and businesses who, who, can show, uh, who did a study in humanities to show students what they can become. And we want the government to change their course and re refocus from the betas to the opportunities uh, humanities has for society. So, we want a lot of things. That's why we went into the world and went asking for them. We've already <laughs> spoken to scholars and they were very enthusiastic, but we've, already, uh, we've also spoken to the Royal Netherlands Ac Academy of Arts and Sciences, who were very interested and want to cooperate. We've talked with v uh, Veno NCW, which is the co Confederation of Netherlands in Industry and Employees, and they also really liked our ideas and also want to cooperate. Um, we've even spoken with our Minister of Education, who not only wants to keep updated on this project, but also gave us some context and agreed to join us when we present the Alpha Pact. So, what's the next step? We are now focusing on getting as much input possible for this pact, and that's where we might need you. If you are interested or inspired about this, please come talk to me afterwards during tea break or so. Um, you can send me emails, I'll hand out my cards. Uh, and in November, we want to organize the think tank for students and everyone who wants to give their last input. After that, hopefully, uh, we're going to write out our plans. And in spring, we want to organize a big congress, maybe a bit like this one, uh, together with the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences and Veno NCW, and maybe even the Minister of Education. Mm -hmm. Then, hopefully, we will sign an alpha pact with all the parties to get what we want. <laughs> I hope I gave you a bit of the action we need. And uh, no, thank you. <laughs> the experience from Hayo and the action, uh, the call for action from Esther. Who wants to ask a question or share an experience that you have on your own, of your own? Anyone? Hello? Yes, Isabel. Yeah, um, well, <laughs> it's interesting, so you started off to say, like, um, 
the older generation had talks like saying the world is against us, students are listening, etc. And you're finishing saying if there's a beta, beta part, there should be an alpha part. Mm -hmm. And we are better in this, we could better this. Are you not afraid that you are um, separating yourself from them? So I've done studies in all three directions, alpha, beta, gamma. And um, my experience is, is that bridging those gaps comes from you. And um, that you can learn if you have not an alpha pact and a beta pact, but you have combined packets, that you become the former for the new future, Leonardo da Vinci's, who integrates all those, um, all those abilities. And what I saw, uh, what I found interesting yesterday, and especially today, so I agree with you that today was very um, promising, that they had invited people that were not from the ivory towers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that came from um, um, only a bachelor in music, or um, someone who was a guitar player, or a dancer, or whatever. And I think all those different views combined mm -hmm. uh, will make the future. And not another, um, so I'm not against your alpha pact or mm -hmm. against the beta pact, but I think you can do it even better than that. Um, that in the end it might lead that the minister is dividing her time or, or dividing the time between okay so much money to the alpha pack so much money to do and then you are um, unintendedly creating the opposite from what you want to attract um, I think the point is that um, what you say the combination and, and looking beyond your own um, your own uh, studies and uh, that's already happening and it's very successful we see uh, digital humanities right now in Amsterdam which is very big and um, uh, that's the, the um, it's not the way to preserve I think the more uh, uh, studies like Italian language and history and um, culture which I study uh, there I don't think there's an easy way to combine that with a uh, more beta kind of science and we want to preserve also the, those uh, parts of, of the humanities. So, of course, in the parts of humanities we, in which we can uh, cooperate with other um, sorts of sciences, we definitely should do that, and that's already working. But this is more focused on preserving the um, parts of the, humani the humanities who need um, those extra push. And I think, of course, we should celebrate the combination of all those things, but we should also preserve parts of our, um, like you told, I, last year I started a platform in preserving language studies because um, a lot of language studies are, have disappeared from Holland uh, the last couple of two years because uh, funding is, uh, well, lot less students, less funding. And um, I don't think the answer to preserving those studies is looking over your own um, field. There was one slide that showed uh, a circle of children and then the conclusion was, um, maybe I rephrase it wrongly, but that it's not uh, no longer about the chain, but it's about the circle. So that doesn't mean that if you are studying Italian languages and, and keeping that up and spreading the news how great and how lovely it is, which I, I do believe, um, that you also have to do physics. It's just realizing that the other one in your circle is doing physics mm -hmm. and why, why you are at the moment an endangered species. Because it can't be that because of a lack of funding you no longer exist. It's because, I think, it has been in a, the Goethe Institute, you're right, German, uh, fewer students and fewer students. They can't keep up their lovely old buildings anymore. So they move to more remote places, which attract even less students, etc. And why is that you haven't thought about being part of a circle and why people would need um, the German language or whatever, and then not tell about you need to use it and convince other people, but have them integrate and practice. Because I think a lot of business people are interested in a lot of humanities. Yeah, but, well, this is something we can um, take with us while writing and thinking about the form mm -hmm. of something like this. I also, the name Alpha Pact is, it's a bit like um, we want to, um, people, yeah, 
it's not sure yet if that's going to be the title, but it's nice that people think, oh, beta alpha pact, and think about we need also something for alphas. But one last remark: the beta pact has been around. I think when I started my studies, there was already beta pact that was named differently. Yeah. But they said, well, especially women should mm -hmm. study science. Yeah, that's also and part of the And sure of a job, a well-paid job, and everything. So far, it has attracted a single, well, I don't know the numbers, you don't know the numbers than I am. But <laughs> I think it hasn't at least not a steep increase in, uh, in student numbers. So be careful that with a beta fact, it's not necessarily but we have a different goal. We don't want to increase in student numbers. I think yeah. Marcus wants to thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, no, thank you. I'm, I love your in initiative. And I, I think, I mean, the idea of a circle um, is, is very appealing, but I think it has one problem. It suggests that all the positions in the circle have the, are the same and equal. And I, I don't think that's the case. I think there are some are more equal than others in that circle. <laughs> and um, and maybe that, yeah. Um, uh, and um, valued more equally, of course, yeah. And um, uh, and once you and <clears throat> once you um, start uh, making a pact across these disciplines, I guess um, the danger is that a dominant paradigm will take over. And um, so I, I kind of like the idea of profiling the humanities as something that is um, has its own profile um, and and doesn't. Um, and, and that is distinct from, from a, a natural sciences paradigm, maybe. More after this, if you're okay with you. There are two more, and then we go on with the discussion, so keep your question in mind. Now, I would like to introduce you Iris van der Taal. She is Assistant Professor of Gender Studies and Philosophy of Science in the Graduate Gender Program of this university in Utrecht. Iris works on feminist. Generation, just say gen, generation. generation, yeah, feminist generations, and feminist new materialism. <coughs> She's currently holding a postdoctoral fellowship of the net of the NBO for her project, the Material Term in the Humanities. Yes. Okay, thank you very much for your introduction, um, and also for organizing this this conference. So my contribution to this panel will uh, focus on time because I think I'm convinced actually that this is the topic of my generation's concern. We're looking at a, an era of undergraduate conferences. So BA students are encouraged to already present papers. We look at graduate student edited collections, not just journals, you know, like copying journals, edited collections by academic publishers. Uh, we have to keep track of the blogosphere, because that's where concepts are coined nowadays, we think at least. And at the necessity of applying for research monies, because contracts often come without research time, or about to be tenured staff, is evaluated on the basis of application success too. I have only five to eight minutes for this presentation, time is running out very fast. So I will stay clear of mapping the situation and simply narrate when and how the issue of the temporality of the contemporary university made itself felt and productively so in my own academic life. So last spring I watched Margarita von Trotta's period film Hannah Arendt in an Amsterdam cinema. This film was one of, the, of many wake up calls for myself and other members of my generation. I've had many discussions with my peers, some of them are here today, about this movie, and we all consider using it in advanced graduate courses. The film is set between 1960 and 1964 during Arendt's engagement with the Eichmann trial and the writing of pieces for the New Yorker, pieces that would go into the banality of evil later on. We see Arendt, played by Barbara Sukowa, in New York City, in Israel, in a cabin in the woods. The film makes Arendt's thinking felt. The rhythm of the film and the movements of Sukowa, she's lying on a couch, she's smoking a cigarette, she's simply breathing, affect the viewer in such a way that she wants to think too, and she wants to think slowly. What we see is Arendt's expansive thought unfolding, and I borrow this phrase from uh, my colleague Michael Blaker, and uh, the, the unfolding part. 
because expansive thought is a concept which I, in turn, borrow from the French historian of science, Hélène Metzger. She was referenced by Kuhn in The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, but she's nowadays an almost forgotten thinker who made quite radical epistemological statements in the 1930s, when French historians and philosophers of science were facing the sudden inauguration of logical positivism. Metzger was stupefied by the juvenile exuberance and aggression, she calls it, uh, this is a quote from her, with which this movement made itself known and argued that both logical positivism and the history of mentalities, well known in France at the time, suffered from a chronological empiricism, which is her concept. The shared objectivist approach to time could not be mapped onto Metzger's own practice of thinking expansively. Metzger, who, by the way, did never get, uh, get a proper academic job, affirmed that while constantly ser searching for a deepened understanding of the past, the historian tries to, and here I quote her, penetrate with greater certainty and more active sympathy the creative thinking of the past in which he infuses new life that he revives for a moment. Moreover, there is a personal subjective factor which is impossible to eliminate completely. It is better to admit it honestly than to deny it a priori. Historians, like all philosophers, like all scientists, and like all humans, have innate tendencies, individual but imperceptible ways of thinking that are themselves not yet opinions or even systems of thought, but that can and do engender such opinions and systems." End of quote. So Metzger is unwilling to separate thought from thinker, and she considers the thinker along embodied lines. She says that the historian, the philosopher, the scientist, all human thinkers, and here I quote her again, try to find or recreate for a moment in itself the forces underlying the works that are the object of their meditation, end of quote. So von Trotta's film, and especially her use, her use of the original black and white documentary footage of Eichmann's trial, makes this kind of thought, this expensive thought, felt. Arendt's effective relation, so you see her shivering, her anger, her stupefaction, and her need to take and make time for the research that she is doing, you, you, this, this transposes to the viewer. So I wish to state immediately that I am myself very much uh, a continental thinker in the French tradition, so my knowledge of Heidegger's What Heist Denken and Arendt's I Want to Understand is quite limited. Nevertheless, I found it important to note that at least von Trotta's movie suggests a reconfigured notion of the time of theory or the temporality of scholarly work. This is the productive moment with which I opened my contribution. What is the time of academic work, of studying, of researching? What is the time of management, of emails, of applications, of large-scale conferences versus the seminar? In The Life of the Mind, Arendt references the philosophy of Henri Bergson, whose work is comparable to Metzger, because it also starts with a certain sympathy for the object or subject of contemplation. Bergson suggests to move away from habitual practices and intellectualization. In Laughter, an essay on the meaning of the comic, Bergson argues, and here I quote him, that the mind crystallizing in certain grooves has epistemologically distortive effects, uh, has an epistemologically distortive effect that is comical, owing to the fact that, and here I quote him again, a mechanism is superposed upon life. Famously, Bergson suggests the intuitive method, not a rationalist method. And this method is referenced by Arendt in her book when she argues the following, and here I quote her again. Um, or here I quote her, actually. Bergson, still so firmly attached to the metaphor of intuition for the ideal of truth, speaks of the essentially active, I might almost say violent, so this is a quote of Bergson in a quote of Arendt, character of metaphysical intuition, without being aware of the contradiction between the quiet of contemplation, very important for Arendt, and any activity, let alone a violent one. End of quote. Of course, we may want to read this violence as a gendered violence on the part of Bergson's, intuition, of, of Bergson's uh, idea that with intuition we can penetrate reality. 
But I wish to follow a line of flight here, also because this violence has in, in fact been deleted from later authorized translations of Bergson's famous essay, Introduction to Metaphysics. Violent, according to Bergson, is spatializing time, not, and here I quote him, placing oneself directly by an effort of intuition in the concrete flowing of duration, end of quote. Spatialized time is Bergson's word for chronological empiricism, for imposing a certain temporality upon what is studied, like the logical positivists and the historians of mentality did, according to Metzger. My question is, is it violent that my generation seems blocked from making time for duration? Rosie Braidotti always teaches us that we are in this together. I suggest that this is temporarily marked, and I also suggest to pay clo close attention to this marking collectively. Thank you. And the last one, Marcus. Marcus Balkenmo is an anthropologist. Uh, he studied in New Zealand and in Germany. Um, and three weeks ago, he finished his PhD. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, the manuscript. He became father of a twin in the meantime and everything, so he's doing very well. He's working now as a postdoctoral fellow here at the Center for Humanities. He's working uh, in Amsterdam and at the Mertens Institute. And his main research interests are postcolonial studies, race, cultural heritage, religion, diaspora, Suriname, and Netherlands. So also, Marcus has a very broad background. Marcus, I'll give you the floor. Uh, thank you uh, very much for this kind introduction and also for inviting me on this panel. Um, and since I've been invited to speak on this panel as a young academic, I am um, going to do something rude and I take the liberty of um, to do what uh, anthropologists like myself are often accused of. I'll talk a little bit about myself. I do this not exclusively out, out of vanity, but because I think it demonstrates something about the historical moment, moment the university is at, at least in the Netherlands. And I, and I then provide another example, and I'll finally try to show how I think they are related. So as um, Anna-Marie just said, I've just submitted uh, the manuscript for my PhD th thesis, which I've been working on over the past five years. The last year of these five years, I had no funding since my contract ended in November 2012. Bills needed to be paid, so I took a job at a startup company as a student mentor, helping students think through and structure their assignments, essays, and theses. These students sought help with this company because they felt they did not find this help with their teachers at university, who were typically overworked, out of time, and impatient. I took the job despite my concerns about this kind of work. Wasn't I supporting precisely the neoliberal university policy as a consequence of which I was forced to take that job in the first place? What is happening to the university when the knowledge it is their task to disseminate is outsourced to these private enterprises that are mushrooming in the Netherlands right now? Not to mention the question of fairness towards students who cannot afford these expensive extra lessons. Many of my colleagues are taking on this kind of job for a lack of opportunities at the university, but even those who, manage, who do manage to secure a job within the academy are often confronted with a similar dilemma. They have a 0.7 employment on temporary contracts, but their workload is often more than that in a full employment. There's virtually no time for them to do research, to publish, or to develop research proposals, which at the same time is also asked of them. But what they ask are the options. I am one of the lucky few who have succeeded in wiggling myself into the university. I feel privileged to have been a fellow at the uh, Center for the Humanities between March and August of this year, and I'll begin no less than two part-time postdoctoral positions in October. So you might say, what is this guy complaining about? So am I out of the woods? Probably not. My contracts are temporary, and in order to con continue after that, I'll have to publish profusely, have my output <coughs> measured and evaluated, etc the things we talked about yesterday. In other words, I have the choice of, su of submitting to the neoliberal publishing re regimes, or I can start looking for a different profession. In that sense, I feel sympathetic to the students John Scott referred to yesterday. This is not only a problem for individual young academics. 
I'm an editor with a small anthropological journal called Ethno4 with a 25-year tradition and the only anthropological journal in the Netherlands. This journal is now close to extinction because it is not ranked and because its peer review procedure is not recognized. This, the journal finds itself in a downward spiral. Who can afford to publish a high-quality article that subsequently cannot uh, be counted in one's record? So, um, um, are there other options? I think there are. At the FU University in Amsterdam, a collective has formed calling themselves the worried employees of the FU, or the Ferrandreuse Fuers. And they were able to build at least some pressure on the management of the university who were otherwise ignoring their staff by and large. Another example, with my fellow editors, we have thought of forming a publishing collective, publishing articles together, and thus meeting, meeting the demands for publication. The question, of course, is um, to what extent that changes anything. So the question I want to put up for discussion is what we can do about this situation. And now I come to my second example, um, which is actually uh, also drawn from um, my research and from um, the people I uh, met there and, hang, uh, and, and was hanging out with. So young black intellectuals are turning their backs on the university and, and some are even leaving the Netherlands. Their reasons may range from structural and outright racism, or what Paul Gilroy yesterday has called uh, reparatory resynchronization, a lack of it, um, uh, or a complexity of other reasons that may have little to do with racism. I find this a worrisome development, and one that ri raises questions about the, uh, uni the idea of the university. Uh, Rosie Bardotti has yesterday called for a pluriversity, and from the viewpoint of a young intellectual who would like to, who would enjoy working in a diverse environment, I feel we are clearly still a long ways from, from that uh, pluriversity. Um, but the fact that these young uh, black intellectuals are turning their back on the, on the university also raises another issue. They refuse to become part of this institution, but they engage critically with both the institution and its scholarly, scholarly traditions and um, bodies of work. They are not or not necessarily public intellectuals or intellectuals in the public but they form intellectual communities or collectives outside of the academy. So far at this conference, we've focused our discussion on either academic culture within the university, touching upon, upon questions of the human and, or the post-human and the role of the hum humanities in these discussions or on the role of the university in the public sphere and society at large. These young intellectuals move away from the university raises another dimension namely how the university relates to other intellectual cultures outside of the institution itself. And you've just um, referred to the blogosphere. And I think this is also what, I'm, what I mean here. And of course, this, is, um, uh, this, this uh, concerns not only young black intellectuals, um, but a, a much wider range of, of intellectuals. I think whichever way one sees this as a problem or as an opportunity, it is something that the university needs to engage with. From my point of view, the examples I've provided have one thing in common. They suggest a, a, a particular watershed, a critical engagement with institutions, or a turn away from it and towards a more particularistic mode. Do we change the institutions, or do we establish new networks um, that are not incorporated in the institution? Personally, I like the idea that uh, Wendy Brown has offered yesterday, yesterday to establish a form of stewardship. Even if I feel that, there's the, that here the challenge will be to democratize a non-democratic institution in order to re-democratize democracy. Mm -hmm. I'm all in. The question for me um, is an old one. Um, how to achieve this in practice on top of the need to survive and pay the bills? Thank you. Thinking the future. 
And I thought that was even more dramatic today with the two techno-utopian uh, 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 speakers who had no sense of the history of technology as they embraced uh, the future for the particular technology of, of the moment. So I wonder um, if in thinking about time, you're thinking about the way in which um, history uh, comes into this story in, in some way or another. Time for duration is not only the time to think the way Arendt did, but it has also something to do with a sense of, of the history that brings you to the historical moment that you're in. I just wonder if you have some, some thoughts about that. Yeah, it's, it's totally part of what I was trying to say. I mean, of course, I, I, I was playing with time on, on two levels. Uh, the, the concrete time of doing academic research, but also how time features in academic research and, and how the way in which we're now supposed to do our scholarship blocks a very deep understanding of time. So that's, that's completely uh, what I was trying to do. Um, I think teaching in a gender studies department makes, make, is, is behind all this. Um, I'm now faced... Uh, I am now in, in classrooms with students that have no conception of power anymore, for example, or that were born after the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall. So I, I also, in my sh quite short academic career, 11 years, I see that the student body is changing. And when you teach in gender studies and, and want to work with gender, and you have the experience that students don't understand what power is or what difference is, or you really have to start in that sense from zero. You cannot but go back to some very fundamental texts, for example. So, and, and then as, a, as, a, as, a, as an academic, you're reading these texts and you find out, at least that happens to me all the time, that these texts are richer than the ways in which they have become anthologized, for example. So that's why I'm especially interested in old texts. And my notion of duration is very much Bergsonian, the virtual past of, the, of texts, for example, because we're in the humanities, and how we can treat, deal with these texts differently because there's multiple futures in these texts. And I find that a much more productive way of dealing with the future than, for example, indeed what we heard earlier today. So. Yeah. First, um, I'm doing great. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to um, um, invite Marcus to expand a bit on his uh, closing uh, remarks. Uh, I'm a self-employed scholar, and you ask how do universities relate to other intellectuals mm -hmm. and other intellectual communities. Um, in my personal experience, it's a bit hybrid. Sometimes they hire you because they need some extra freelance teaching uh, hands. And on other occasions, they completely ignore you because you're not one of us. So I think more important is how does the public perceive these other intellectuals, intellectual communities, because for them, a university is approved knowledge. And if you have um, a self-employed business, then you are commercial, so you can't be trusted. So I think that's very, well, could be an exciting topic for you to think about also. Uh, can you do that now? <laughs> no, I think, I think uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that goes to the heart of it, really. I, I mean, it's, it's of course, uh, you know, how to, um, Acknowledge that knowledge is being produced not only in the university but also also elsewhere, and um, uh, how to um, how to um, acknowledge that I think is the question. And the, I, I wonder if the um, public should be the judge of that. Um, I mean, personally, I, I that's why I, I um, ref referenced um, Wendy Brown. I think I think that it needs to be an institute. Uh, uh, you know. Um, the march to the institutions, and um, um, I don't. I, I I think the danger of of you know forming new uh, collectives and you know new new networks as much as I like it is uh, the danger is that that it in the end supports the um, the system um, that made it necessary in the first place. I, I think it's um, 
important to distinguish between the idea of university, what we've well, been invited to um, uh, discuss these two days, and the system or the institution that is, say, the gatekeeper of that idea. And I think that uh, in the past two days, it's been about the gatekeeping system and how it's become neoliberalized and how that is uh, affecting the work. But in the end, the idea of uni university doesn't necessarily have to be in this context. So I'm not sure if new networks will be the answer to this, but I also publish in academic journals. Um, still, the perception of me being self-employed is for the public an indication that it's, it's of a different value than if I were to be in university. So I, maybe if these communities and universities uh, become allies in this, then we can share the work because there's lots of work to be done. Mm -hmm. but, but this different value, I mean, you have the same thing because a publication from somebody who's affiliated to Harvard University is also viewed of a different value than Carolina State. So you'll have that always. And the fact if you're self employed, that people will, will, will search for, uh, for a commercial background is actually right because there is a, a much larger chance that there is one. So I, I don't I don't really agree with you that, that, that it's really valued of a different way from from first sight yes but if you read the article it's about the article and about the science in it. I don't think it's that clear cut anymore that uh, university uh, researchers are uh, some in in some way neutrally sponsored or funded because mm -hmm. if I go and look on the internet yeah, that, that is exactly one of the problems. All the projects about crowdfunding research. Yeah. Mm -hmm by university researchers. So that it's, it's not that clear cut anymore. That's true. Yeah. And that is exactly one of the reasons why I do not uh, agree with, with, uh, with a, um, a rector who claims that knowledge valorization is one of the three pillars of a university. That is, that is, that is asking for problems, in my perspective. Well, the first, yeah, yeah, you want to relate on this question. Yes. Rick, you have a different question. Yeah. Okay, so the time first. Yeah, there's different things in my head now. Um, let's think of the last thing you said about valorization. I think valorization is often thought of in terms of money, making money, but valorization, I think we need to understand that more broader. It's also about whether the things you're doing are in some way society relevant. And I think that's something that uh, academics have to think about. Um, I think yesterday one of the speakers uh, um, spoke about um, uh, learning for its own sake. I think I, I, I can't understand personally. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a very much uh, eager learner. I've always been that, but never for its own sake. There's always some sort of a connection to to a, 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 a real life problem that I want to understand or that I want to engage with. So uh, I and, and and so I think. One of the ways of dealing with this notion of valorization and the, the um, society asking for valorization is broadening up that concept beyond uh, e uh, uh, economy or beyond making money, per se. And um, another thing is, I, I wanted to respond on the, um, <coughs> the, 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 the idea of, of, of uh, intellectual networks. Um, 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 be outside the university, uh, like uh, Flo, I'm also a self-employed uh, researcher, um, and I think it's it's actually a very interesting way of, of getting connected to societal actors and, and working with them. And it's not always the case that they don't uh, like trust you or, or or think your knowledge is less valuable. Um, you also have a, a bigger freedom to actually engage with their problem. Uh, and, and you don't have to worry about, okay, is this going to give me another article because I have to uh, keep up with my, uh, mm -hmm. my ranking. So, yeah, I personally was also very much inspired uh, by uh, Henk Oosterling yesterday, who combines the two. I think that, I hope that that will be the future, actually, people being in both worlds. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, something that I just want, I, 
to, to, um, to hear from you is, is more of that ex of the experience. And if, you, if I, I heard in every one of your talks something, and if you excuse if I use the, the Bergsonian metaphor of, the, and very interesting, the violence that has been erased from his own text, but as the chronological uh, spatialization or the mechanism that is impressed over duration. But at the end of the talk, I got the sense that you felt that this, that you are all, that you were experiencing this as something as duration. It gave you an access to a duration that was now collective. And the one thing that I noticed in, in most of the presentation was your experience, this is this experience of this mechanism that you are in, the neoliberal acceleration of your degrees, the way that time is being measured in your programs, the way that your careers uh, are being quantified and that sort of thing. Is that giving you a collect, are you all sharing the same duration or do you just have the same mechanism in common? <laughs> trying to say what I was trying to say is that that's it's very much a mechanism <laughs> that is imposed in a way where and and that's also why I brought in this the, the Hannah Arendt movie because that that movie showed me again what it actually means when you're sitting or what actually happens when you're finally having this quiet afternoon behind your desk and yeah that's, that's, that was the two, the two sides that I was, that I was trying to uh, work with. Whereas, of course, there are durational moments, too, <coughs> in the university, as it is right now. Uh, it's, it's not, I'm not trying to say that it's, it's, it's all black and white. But that movie made something renewedly available to me. You immediately began talking with friends who were also sharing the experience of the movie and began to... Yes, because we were all, in a way, shocked by that movie, by the way in which we saw somebody thinking. And we were re I mean, it's, I don't know, some, some of these people are here in the room, so please speak up. <laughs> but the, the shock of the, the, the slowness and how much time it takes, and, and a person that gets a phone call, you're missing your deadline, and basically saying, I better get back to work, bye, click, and just going on totally slowly, working, quiet, typing, typewriter, all these things. But I think, I'm one of the friends. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was not only the shock of seeing her, so seeing the slowness, and sort of the smoking and the lying down, but exactly this act of sovereignty, sort of to say to the New Yorker mm -hmm. editor who was calling her, she was saying, you're not pressuring me for a deadline, are you? <laughs> so I better get back to work. So this, this sort of, um, you know, not even taking this on, um, the pressure, I think that was a, a, a sh yeah, really a shock uh, in the sense of, we do feel under a lot of pressure and not in the position to answer that, by saying, you're not pressuring me, are you? I mean, that was a, that's unheard of, sort of. I think that's uh, uh, complementing the slowness that we were both so shocked about. Yeah, but I, I think, I mean, the, the share, share, or the sense of sharedness um, emerges when you, um, be, when you become aware that there is a mechanism and that you're not um, alone just with that editor and, um, or with that dean or, or, you know, that you have to answer to. But that that there is a that, uh, there are possible. I mean, that's why I, I brought the example of the of the worried employees of the FU. I, I think it, you know there is still this possibility of of um, of doing something together. I mean, you know, you referenced Hannah Arendt, and probably solidarity is an old-fashioned word today. But I, I think it I think it's still relevant. Solidarity or even collective action. wonder why this me mechanism has been embraced actually because the problem is not only in universities you have the yeah. same thing in healthcare lower uh, lower education it's basically everywhere yeah. and i can understand that that there there are some political forces that try to impose it but i'm sometimes really startled by the 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 the, the, the eagerness uh, with which people em em embrace these things and actually usually it is 
um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to, 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 to use the word again, it, it's the older generation that doesn't feel the direct results of that because they have a tenured position. So, and right now you come at a, actually at, at a sort of breaking point maybe in which uh, new talented, very smart people choose a different career because uh, simple financial reasons and, and, and stuff. So now it, it starts to become a very big problem, but it's already been growing for, for probably 10, 15 years or something. But I'm not sure if I agree with this um, generational divide because I think the pressure is also felt by, um, you know, by uh, people with tenure as well. Um, you know, the increased um, demand for public sh publications and, and funding the, money. And, yeah, uh, the publication pressure, but they don't have any... I mean, you, you have twins. I have a, um, a young kid. For, it, for us, it's going to be a big problem. After two years, my grand ends. What am I going to do? I mean, I changed careers... Or it's also my own fault, of course, but I changed careers already one time. What am? Yeah, but I mean, jobs, what are you gonna do? Tenured jobs are on the line as well. Yeah, but, yeah, it's true. Yeah. But. but on the other hand, it's also a matter of uh, that we are living in a different era now. So in every profession, uh, people no longer have jobs that last thirty years and that have security for their mortgage or for whatever. So I think flexibility in jobs. But it actually is, is, is not true. That's only uh, the higher education, actually. And That's a weird thing. Absolutely not. I'm from a very large family and some of them are, uh, um, are cab drivers and it, there's a variety of people there. They're all suffering the same things. But mm -hmm. what makes them survive is that they don't experience it as suffering. They see it as an opportunity. Because all those elderly who had a job for 30 years, they might have thought, uh, how lucky would I be if I had a chance to do something else? You know, so you can also see it as a new possibility to experience other things, to grow, uh, to keep your brain running, etc. Instead of seeing it as a fear or a threat or whatever. Moreover, I think it's yeah, it's a different opposition, I guess. It's a, Can I? Oh. And basically, it's also not true because uh, they, the, when when they fire uh, people in in, 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 in in the harbors in the metal fa uh, factories, is because of re reorganizations and all that thing. But basically, they have a uh, uh, long-term contract. Now they start to give people two-year contracts uh, and uh, so forth. Traditionally, the the the, the Sorry? I want to No, it can it's 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 it's, it's not legal. I want to speak up. I mean one of the things that I think we experience both in Europe and the United States is that I gather you talked somewhat about it yesterday, I wasn't able to be here, but it's was the, was the relationship between the university and the broader republic. And I think that there are things that, there, 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 are, there are clearly opportunistic politicians who use the university as a punching bag for their own local populist crusades, or for, to get through, they don't like the university's positions on environmental or other issues, so that they attack the university um, as saying that this isn't real science because it says pollution could cause cancer or something like that. But there, I think there's a there's part of it, the responsibility for this does lie for us in the university. And my, you know, there's, there's a way of thinking that became quite common in the 50s and 60s and 70s, which was that there was scholarship and there was popularization. And there was a radical divide between something suspect about scholars that addressed a wider public, that they were pandering, they were somehow vulgarizing uh, the, the, the research, or they were doing it for personal gain, but that there was, it, it was considered to be a, a, a crossing of a line that should be respected. And, and I think that one of the consequences of that was the conditions under which it became harder for independent scholars and independent intellectuals non-university intellectuals uh, to, to, to have a place. And, but the other side of that is that I think in the university, we do have a chance to address issues and in ways that are engaged by a broader public. And 
my sense is looking at some of the work that I love, that I admire by colleagues, um, whether it's in history or in physics or in other domains, is that they you can speak about very difficult conceptual issues, but not under a protective garb of a whole lot of jargon. That it's not conceptual difficulty which marks <coughs> the dividing line. But if you have to be initiated into a specialized Okay, I'm not, there are times when you need a special technical term to do certain work, but not as much as we often act like there is. And um, like a physicist like Lenny Susskind, one of the great string theorists, and he considers some of the books that he's written at a popular level, level part of his research. So he writes in a, in a common idiom, but they're conceptually challenging. And he considers the working out of those questions, say, about entropy in a black hole, to be part of what, uh, what he does. That is his research, it's not something else. It's unusual, but I think it's, it's an exemplary instance. And I think that you have that also in parts of history and where historians have engaged with the tobacco industry or other, other issues and, and played a role in, in, in international law and uh, as to what the tobacco companies knew and when they knew it about the danger, the dangers associated with, with, with cigarettes. Or you have people that have been involved with, uh, the, with nuclear waste and disarmament or uh, the, the large-scale industrial agri agriculture that's been, that's been discussed. I think that so you can address the, these wider issues. And I think pulling people into fields so that they feel like the university is stand for them in some way, mm -hmm. and that they have a stake in these universities, and maybe they could gain something from them in what people there do, but also in their own relationship with continuing education. And you know, this, Our students are not going to just be 18. They're going to be 28, and 38, and 58, and 78. And more and more, they are. So I think that, uh, I think that the, the, this contract, the implicit and sometimes explicit contract between society and the university and the university and the arts and the university and other practical domains of industry is, is something that we can take some more responsibility for inside the university and both invite in people in scholarly and activists and other groups outside but also a broader public that wants to learn and that considers continuous and continuing education to be part of what they expect and want in their lives. We actually have a group here. Of these. <laughs> great. Thank you. One very, very last, and then we go for a break. Um, well, maybe um, I am an example. I'm one of these uh, oldies um, you were talking about. And um, I'm already 62, and I'm very, very happy because I just, I, it's even worse. I just got a brand new job on my 62, and it was at the Technical University in Delft. So here is hope. <laughs> and one of my job, my job is, um, I'm a development manager. My job is to uh, try to get the force money stream. Um, well, that's kind of new uh, money stream. There's not the valorization one, but the next one, without. Um, Ooh, well, it's what more for uh, good causes, for like that technique you can also sell as good cause. Mm -hmm. So we have contact with the Cancer Foundation. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know if this is a good uh, example mm -hmm. because all the yeah, papers are terrible side, stories. <laughs> but um, the techni technique also has a huge um, impact, a huge impact on social, uh, yeah issues. Mm -hmm. I think you were talking about that you were reading from your <coughs> iPad. Well, I think without technique you can read the iPad. So I used to think, well, more or less what she said, that it has to be integrated and balanced. And the, the last funny thing is that my, I started the 1st of June together with a new colleague. She's 20 years younger and she uh, used to uh, to do fundraising for the Netherlands Dance Theater. And she also studied art and this and that, but before that she was a dancer herself. <coughs> so I feel like a fish in water here in this, uh, <laughs> this day. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you.
Well, I think there's a lot to discuss and we want to elaborate on this conference more and more. It was for us the first step and we'd like to engage with all young and older, wise, experienced people uh, to go further on. But now we have a tea break and after the tea break at, I say, half past three, we <coughs> continue uh, with a lecture by Greg Lambert. So please be there.